This episode is brought to you by Prolific, my online training program that gives you a deep dive into productivity, creativity, goal setting, and finding your life's mission. The program has been featured on Lifehacker, Entrepreneur Magazine, and Business Insider. It was created because I have been asked many times how I've been able to produce over 1,000 blog posts, hundreds of podcast episodes, and written over 30 books in a relatively short period of time. Prolific gives you all of my tactics tactics, strategies, and tools. Go to prolificcourse.com if you're interested. Hi friends, welcome to another edition of the Christ is All podcast. Now today, I'm going to read two chapters from a book I have written entitled Jesus Now, Unveiling the Present-Day Ministry of Christ. And I'm reading these two chapters myself because unlike most of my 14-plus books, this title did not come out in audiobook. The second reason is because I believe that this message of what Jesus Christ is doing now, that is, his present-day ministry, is needed very much for the time in which we live. Here is the introduction. What is Jesus doing now? There's a lovely little story about a skydiver who drifted over a hundred miles off course and landed in a dense forest. Strung up in the tree, tangled and terrified of the fast-approaching night, He began to yell out for help. After a few minutes, a man who was out for a walk chanced upon the skydiver. Hello, I need help. Where am I? Called the man in the tree. You're stuck in a tree with no way out. You're surrounded by a forest and it's getting dark, the other man replied. Of all my luck, said the skydiver to him, I get stuck with a minister as a rescuer. Hearing this, the passerby wondered aloud how the distressed man knew about his occupation as a religious teacher. Well, the man in the tree said, I just assume you must be a minister, as what you've said is both utterly true and absolutely useless in helping me. When professional ministers hear this story, they usually get a chuckle out of it, in part because they can detect the grain of truth it holds. So much of our conversations about spiritual things, while perhaps good and even spot on, are nearly devoid of relevant impact. It's not only Christianity that gets targeted by this critique. Most academic or philosophical movements also struggle to reach us where we really live. One of the greatest concerns I have for the good news today is that we often present a gospel that is more true than useful. This is never more true than when we're considering the subject and actor of our entire faith, Jesus Christ. Think about it. The story is familiar to all Christians. The Gospels introduce us to the earthly ministry of Jesus. He was born in Bethlehem. He grew up in the ill-starred town of Nazareth, where he labored as an artisan. Around age 30, he was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and he began his ministry. Interestingly, Jesus' ministry lasted less than four years. He was crucified outside the city of Jerusalem, rose again from the dead three days later, and spent 40 days on earth in his resurrected state. He then ascended into heaven, taking his seat at the right hand of God the Father. In our book, Jesus of Theography, Leonard Sweet and I retold the incredible story of Jesus' earthly ministry using all the biblical material from Genesis to Revelation. We also discussed in some detail his pre-existent state before creation and his promised second coming at the end of the age. To my knowledge, few books have been dedicated to exploring the present-day ministry of Jesus. By present-day ministry, I'm referring to what Jesus has been doing since his ascension and will continue to do until his second coming. Herein lies the aim of this book. It's an exploration into the present-day ministry of Christ, and it seeks to answer the question, What is Jesus Christ doing right now, and how is his present-day ministry useful to me? As we reflect on the Lord's earthly ministry, the following aspects stand out. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. He revealed his Father. He healed the sick. He performed miracles. He cast out demons. He fed the poor. 
He befriended sinners. He rebuked the religious. He trained and sent disciples. He went to the cross and dealt with the effects of the fall. He rose from the dead, ushering in the new creation and becoming Lord of the world. The Lord then ascended into heaven to take his place of authority and power. Yet Jesus Christ isn't sitting at the Father's right hand, passively waiting to return to planet Earth. No, he is still active today. And the man in the glory has a very specific ministry. Concerning his personality, plan, and purpose, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13.8 Concerning his ministry, however, it has changed somewhat from the days of his flesh. That's a phrase from Hebrews 5.7. In this book, we will explore the different aspects of the present-day ministry of Christ. We will find out what Jesus is doing now and its relevance to you and me. Hebrews 13.8 Yesterday, in Hebrews 13.8, has in view Christ's ministry before creation as well as his earthly ministry. Today has in view his present day ministry. Forever has in view his ministry that moves into eternity. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our focus in this book will be upon Jesus Christ's ministry today, or to put it succinctly, Jesus now. Let's begin. And then I follow that introduction with a song entitled, There's a Man in the Glory. And I will read the lyrics. There's a man in the glory whose life is for me. He's pure and he's holy, triumphant and free. He's wise and he's loving, how tender is he. His life in the glory, my life must be. His life in the glory, my life must be. There's a man in the glory whose life is for me. He overcame Satan from bondage. He's free. In life he is reigning. How kingly is he? His life in the glory. My life must be. His life in the glory. My life must be. There's a man in the glory whose life is for me. In him is no sickness. No weakness has he. He's strong and in vigor. How buoyant is he? His life in the glory. My life must be. His life in the glory. My life must be. There's a man in the glory whose life is for me. His peace is abiding. How patient is he? He's joyful and radiant, expecting to see. His life in the glory lived out in me. His life in the glory lived out in me. Written by Mary McDonough in 1787. Now, before I read the next chapter for this podcast episode, I will go through the chapters in chronological order. Chapter 1 is Great High Priest. Chapter 2 is Chief Shepherd. Chapter 3 is Heavenly Bridegroom. Chapter 4 is Author and Finisher of Our Faith. Chapter 5 is Builder of Ecclesia. Chapter 6 is Head of the Church. Chapter 7 is Lord of the World. Chapter 8 is called Jesus Christ Today, and I will read it. So who is Jesus today? Is he someone we remember and try to emulate? Or is he someone who is living and active and has a specific ministry? In the previous pages, we've seen that the ascension of Jesus marked the commencement of his present-day ministry. In reaching his own destiny, Jesus reached it for us too. Christ led us to the place that neither Abraham, Moses, Joshua, nor David could ever lead us. Jesus presents himself to God the Father as high priest as both offerer and offering, since we are in Christ, as the Father receives Jesus, he also receives you and me. When Christ ascended into heaven, he did not drop his human body. He is still the human Jesus with a glorified human body. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul called the glorified body of Jesus a spiritual body. Verse 44. This doesn't mean that he was a ghost. It means that his renewed physical body was energized by the Holy Spirit after his resurrection. In his glorified body, Jesus could eat and drink physical food. He could also pass through walls. Luke 24, 13 to 35, John 20, verse 26. Consequently, Jesus continues his incarnation after his ascension and receives our humanity into himself. He didn't dispose of our humanity, but took it with him into heavenly realms. Jesus penetrated the splendor of heaven, wearing our flesh, bringing us to his Father. 
Theologically speaking, the ascension reveals that Jesus' incarnation continues, and the Father, Spirit, and Son have taken up our humanity into God's bosom forever. Jesus retains his humanity and his divinity and reigns over the world as the God-man until all enemies are put under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 28. We, the collective people of God, are the continuing incarnation and presence of Jesus on the earth today. Did Jesus fail? To natural minds, Jesus' ministry ended in failure on two counts. One, a failure in Galilee when most of his followers turned away from him. And two, a failure in Jerusalem when his disciples deserted him and he was put to death on a cross. But the work of Christ went on. Jesus was raised by his Father and ascended to God's right hand. Ephesians 1, 20-22, Colossians 3, 1, Hebrews 1, 3, 7, 26, 8, 1, 10, 12. But he didn't retire, nor was he detached from the world. Instead, he began his present-day ministry, where he became powerfully present with his followers. His followers weren't to carry on Jesus' work in his absence. No, Jesus shared his ministry with them. Mark 16, 19 to 20, Acts 1, verses 1 to 2. The work of God today is still the work of Christ. He carries it out in his enthroned state, withdrawn from visible sight, but active in spirit, in and through his followers. The book of Acts would be more accurately called the Acts of the Risen Christ through his Apostles. While Christ is no longer visible to unaided human sight, he is still powerfully active through his disciples. Jesus doesn't operate us by remote control. He's present with us by his Spirit. He's not a clockmaker who sets the work going and then leaves it to go on by its own momentum. No, Jesus keeps it going himself. Jesus still is, present tense, the visible image of the invisible God. Colossians 1 verse 15. When we see Jesus operating through his people, we see God. Jesus is still the human face of God. True freedom. As our mediator, Jesus carries our names on his shoulders and breast, just as the high priest of the Old Testament carried the names of Israel on his shoulders and breast. Christ's position of sitting at the right hand of the Father signifies rest. It denotes a completed and finished work. There's no more to be done. Jesus' blood was completely and eternally accepted by God the Father. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was once and for all, but his ministry of intercession is eternal. He is the Son of God and the Son of Man eternally. As high priest, Jesus makes intercession on the basis of his own spotless perfection. It's as if he says to the Father, quote, Receive me for them. Forgive all of their imperfections on the basis of my sinless perfection. End of quote. In the presence of God, the mighty perfection of Jesus is the answer for our sins. Hence, we don't come before God the Father in ourselves. We come to God in Christ, by Christ, and through Christ. And God is satisfied with us in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. For this reason, Jesus is the author of our eternal salvation. Hebrews 5 9, New King James Version. So when we speak of Jesus interceding for us, Jesus isn't reminding the Father about what he did. How could the Father forget? Nor is he pleading his sacrifice before a reluctant God. Christ's very presence in heaven as the crucified one constitutes the greatest prayer and intercession. The wounds of Christ are the unceasing prayers of Jesus. By them, he has secured constant and free access to God's throne. Hebrews 4.16 A guilty conscience, a conscience stained by sin, cannot be purified by anything else but the blood of Christ. No other sacrifice for the sins of humankind is necessary. Jesus' death was a once-and-for-all sacrifice. Hebrews 9.26 Jesus has passed into a realm wherein we have access. We don't have to wait to die to enter it. Eternal life begins now. The veil has been torn and the way into the holiest opened. More remarkably, our great high priest, Jesus, leads our worship in the midst of the ecclesia. Through the Spirit, Christ comes into our midst and offers our praise and worship to a welcoming Father. Through the church, Jesus sings to his Father, leading our praises. Hebrews 2, 12, 8, 
verses 1 to 2. So Jesus is the perfecter not only of our faith, but also of our worship. This relates to our prayer life as well. We enter into the fellowship that the Son has with his Father. 1 John 1, 1 to 3. 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Jesus is not only the object of our prayers, but he's the means. As our High Priest, Christ by the Spirit, prays in and through us. Romans 8, 26 to 27. According to the New Testament, prayer is in Christ, through Christ, and to Christ. The Mighty Name of Jesus In the scriptures, the name of a person represents who that person is. Thus, when the early Christians did something in Jesus' name, they were doing it in the presence and the authority of Christ. Therefore, doing or saying something in Jesus' name is like exercising a God-mandated power of attorney. Jesus' person is united to his name. For this reason, the New Testament uses believing in Jesus and believing in his name synonymously. John 1, 12, 2, 23, 3, 18, 1 John 5, 13. Before Jesus rose again and ascended, he told his disciples that they hadn't asked anything in his name, John 16, 24. But he told them that after his ascension, Whatever they asked in his name or his person would be granted them by the Father. John 16, 23, 14, 13 to 15. The disciples cast out demons and healed the sick in Jesus' name. Mark 16, 17 to 18, Acts 3, 1 to 6, chapter 16, verse 18, James 5, 14. Salvation is found in no other name under heaven. Acts 4, 12. The name of Jesus stands above every other name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in all three realms, heaven, hell, and earth. Philippians 2, 9-11 Strangely dim. The ascension demonstrates that we are part of another world, another realm, another kingdom. As Christians, therefore, we shouldn't identify ourselves with the present age, whether country, culture, or race. We are part of a new humanity where Jesus is head. As partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4, we have a source of continuing transformation that empowers us to transcend nationalism, racism, and culture wars, to be a people of reconciliation who stand in the gap between the petty conflicts that often rule this present age. The ascension shows us that the church ought not to be captive to the partisan spirit of this present world. We are not home in this old world, which is passing away. Rather, we are part of the new heavens and the new earth. The ascension is God's no to the principalities and powers, and God's yes to his Son. Jesus has triumphed, and there is no other Lord but him. Acts 2.36 Historically, Christians have made three main errors when it comes to their relationship to the world. Properly understood, the ascension of Jesus corrects each error. They are, problem one, withdrawal from the world. Solution in his ascension, the body of Christ is Jesus acting in and for the world. Christians are light and salt in a dark world. Recall that when Jesus was on earth in his human body, his main task was to see what his Father was doing and join himself to it. Today, our main task is to see what Jesus Christ is doing and join ourselves to it. Thus, we don't draw away from the world. We enter into it and follow Jesus wherever he is moving there. Problem 2. Trying to bring the kingdom on earth. Solution. In his ascension, Jesus brings part of his kingdom on earth now through his ecclesia, but he will also bring it in its fullness only at his second coming. The kingdom is here already, but also not yet. We cannot bring the kingdom into being in our own power, and we cannot bring the kingdom ahead of the king. Problem 3. Conformity to the world. Solution. In his ascension, Christ lives in his people by the power of his indwelling life. That life keeps us distinct from the world and its values as we answer a higher, more compassionate call. The Lord's ascension also proves that Jesus is Lord. As such, his followers are part of a different kingdom with a different core trajectory. Looking at all three problems and their solutions, we encounter a paradox in scripture. And that paradox can be put this way. For God so loved the world, versus love not the world. Footnote. For details, you can freely listen to my conference message, For God so loved the world, versus love not the world, which is a previous episode on this podcast. 
We live on earth with a life of eternity in our spirits. The ecclesia is a colony of heaven on earth. Ephesians 2, 18-22, Philippians 3, 20-21, 20 1 Peter 2, 9-12, Hebrews 11, 13-16. The Holy Spirit is the reality of Christ's presence and dispenses to us the very life that Jesus lived. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came as the Spirit of the glorified Jesus, the Spirit of the incarnate, crucified, and exalted Christ. The Spirit came to take the life that had interwoven humanity and divinity in the person of Jesus and dispense it to God's people. And He, Christ, promised to be present with us until the consummation of the age. Matthew 28, verse 20. Knowing that Jesus is ascended and enthroned in heaven, we have assurance of final victory. We take the time to pay attention and rest in these promises. This knowledge delivers us from fear, depression, and insecurity during the trials and tests of life. Whatever happens, Christ is still on the throne and in control. The Jesus of yesterday is the Jesus of today and will one day become the Jesus of tomorrow. Our representative man has reached the goal. The forerunner blazes the path for us all. We are partners of the heavenly calling, Hebrews 3.1, pioneers of the heavenly way. He has dominion over heaven and earth. He secured the eternal purpose of God and ascended on high to bring forth many sons to glory, Hebrews 2.10, Ephesians 4.8. And for reasons hidden in his infinite love and mercy, God has allowed us to participate in Christ's present-day ministry of sanctification and redemption. We can lay hold of these realities only with the eyes of faith. I'll close with a statement from a friend of mine named Barbie Myers. In 2004, I delivered a series of messages on the present-day ministry of Jesus Christ to a local fellowship in Southern California. Barbie was one of the members of this fellowship. And after I traveled back home, she began emailing me the group's reflections on the messages I had delivered while there. Here's a statement from Barbie that was part of those emails. In Jesus, the Son of Man, all of the Godhead was contained in a single physical body. The cross broke Jesus open, and through the opening, God's life was subject to reproduction into prepared vessels in which his role as high priest would be expressed to the world. Jesus took to his Father the experience as the Son of Man and left that experience in his spirit to be part of the life he impregnated into those called to be sons and daughters of God. I am a needy human being, but my weaknesses do not plague me like they used to. They are simply who I am outside of Christ. While my sins may trouble me, God has made provision. I have only to say my high priest's name, and his ever-flowing blood touches the tarnished threads in the fabric of my life and restores its luster. Faithful is he as advocate, intercessor, and heavenly lawyer. This is Jesus today. Well, I hope that this has blessed you and if you're interested in getting a copy of the entire book or reading some sample chapters from it, you can go to jesusnow.tv. jesusnow.tv. God bless. Hey guys, this is a postscript just before you head out and we part ways. I have created a bundle of free resources. This would include my other podcasts, the YouTube channel, several free ebooks, free seminars, and other free resources. And you can find all of that at frankviola.com. And if you go to frankviola.com, you will see in the top menu a link that says free stuff. You just click on that and you will be taken to the free resources page. Also, a number of you have asked if you could donate to help defray the costs of the podcasts and also to express appreciation for the value that you've been receiving. You're under no obligation to donate. I don't ask for donations, but should you have it on your heart to do so, you can go to frankviola.us. That's frankviola.us. And that will take you to a donate page. There's three different options you can use to donate, all of them simple. Thank you very much, and God bless.